The first slaves in the Americas were not African, and the first Africans in the Americas were not slaves. Black sailors, soldiers, servants, and settlers arrived in the Americas in the 15th century, along with the earliest Europeans. For instance, Juan Las Canarias was a free black sailor who served on Columbus's flagship, the Santa Maria, during the first transatlantic voyage in 1492. These first black colonists were from Spain rather than Africa and were known as Ladinos. People of African heritage were always a part of the colonial experience in the southeastern U.S. In Spanish Florida, African people had been a part of the colony of St. Augustine since its establishment in 1565. They came from the Caribbean and South America, as well as from Africa. Most African Floridians lived in St. Augustine, scattered throughout the town. They were both free and unfree, and probably made up about 10% of the town's overall population. The two European powers who settled most of North America's southeastern region were in constant struggle over control of the land between South Carolina and Florida. During the 16th century, Spain considered Florida, La Florida, to extend from the Keys all the way up to the Chesapeake Bay and west to the Mississippi River. That was Florida, and it was Spanish territory, and they did not want any of the other European nations trying to colonize it or explore it or exploit it. American Indians, who were the original inhabitants of the area, also fought to retain or regain their occupied lands. Africans, in the Americas against their will, were often caught in the middle of this international rivalry. In 1686, the Spaniards in St. Augustine began to spread the word that escaped slaves would be given religious sanctuary in Spanish Florida. Word of the Spanish policy spread rapidly among the black populations of the Carolinas, and the number of escapees to Florida steadily increased. In the turbulent frontier society of 18th century colonial southeastern North America, African slaves created opportunities to gain their freedom. You, know, you have to imagine um, someone taking advantage of the first, first opportunity, uh, whether it be a fire, an accidental fire, whether it be uh, the master or the overseer getting sick, or whether it be another um, Native American uprising. Whatever the case may be, um, to which we, we often call now an opportunistic revolt, I can imagine slaves uh, utilize. If you think about the Underground Railroad, most of, most of what you learned in history is that the Underground Railroad went north up into Canada. It is a, a part of U.S. history that's just not well known. The first Underground Railroad runs south. It runs south to St. Augustine, not north. The first recorded group of fugitives arrived in St. Augustine in 1687 and included eight men, two women, and a nursing child. The policy of giving religious sanctuary to escaped slaves was Spanish Florida's creative solution to a number of local problems. Welcoming the refugees served to strike an economic blow at the English colonies, while at the same time aiding skilled workers and Catholic converts to the Spanish colonies. Formal legal sanctions for this policy came in 1693 when King Charles II of Spain issued a royal proclamation on the status of runaways to Florida, giving liberty to all the men as well as the women, so that by their example and by liberty, they will do the same. If you were enslaved on an English plantation, if you could make it to Spanish territory, you would be given your freedom with the provision that you joined the militia, became Catholic, and provided some service. By 1738, more than 100 African fugitives had reached St. Augustine. In that year, the Spanish government established the fort and community of Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mosé, about two miles north of the town. I think something truly remarkable happens in that a sense of community begins to grow.
there were 38 households of men, women, and children at the Mose community. Fort Mose and, and the town of Mose were not just an isolated place on the frontier. They immersed themselves into Spanish culture. They were connected regularly with St. Augustine. They not only immersed themselves, but they actually thrived. All of the inhabitants of Mose were Catholic and received instruction in that faith. There was a church in the town made of boards and thatch and a resident missionary priest. The people of Mose were baptized, married, and buried in St. Augustine. However, where the cathedral was located, a few objects that may have been related to religious life were excavated at the Fort Mose site. The people at Mose came from a variety of West African areas. And the Spaniards recorded everything they could, particularly when people were baptized or converted, and they would record their origins in Africa. So we know where in Africa the individuals who lived at Mose came from, and it was a range of Congo, Caravali, Mandingo, Igbo, uh, and others. Upon their arrival in St. Augustine, many of the male fugitives from the Carolinas were made members of the Spanish slave militia. And in 1738, they formed a free black company. Having escaped from Carolina, these African Americans knew the region well and would fight to the death if their former English masters invaded from the north. The captain of the Mose militia was Francisco Menendez, who had first been appointed captain of the St. Augustine slave militia in 1726. Like other Mose officers, Menendez was an escaped slave. Fort Mose quickly came to represent freedom to countless African Americans in South Carolina. In September 1739, black workers at Stono, near Charleston, launched the largest slave uprising in the history of North American colonies. Scores of armed slaves joined forces and began marching toward Florida and possible freedom before a white militia crushed the revolt. After the Stono Rebellion of 1739, Authorities in Charleston blamed the Spanish for helping to incite the uprising. Mose was one of a number of frontier outposts constructed during the 18th century. The soldiers at Fort Mose had more than symbolic value for Florida. With only several thousand Europeans and several hundred Africans, the small Spanish colony needed strong defenses, and the black militia at Fort Mose represented an important force to defend St. Augustine. The original fort at Mose was small, 20 meter square enclosure containing a watchtower, a well, and a guardhouse. Its walls were earth, stakes, and cactus, and it was surrounded by a shallow moat. Mose was intended to be a farming as well as a defensive community. The Spaniards in St. Augustine hoped that the Mose farmers could produce enough food not only for themselves, but also as extra food for the colony. They probably farmed corn and maybe rice but it is clear from the documents that they were unable to meet even their own needs. The Mose residents supplemented their crops in numbers of ways. Residents received government supplies at irregular intervals, including corn, beef, pork, rice, and biscuit. They also earned extra government food rations by working on government construction projects. Perhaps most importantly, people at Mose hunted and fished in the nearby woods and streams and probably gathered wild plants and fruits. Isabel de los Rios was a free African woman who lived in St. Augustine and sold fresh baked Spanish rolls, sugar syrup, and other provisions from her home. We know of Isabel and of Captain Crispin de las Tapia, a free African man who ran a grocery store, through court records. Both provisioners testified in a 1695 court case against several Appalachian Indians that had given them counterfeit money for the purchase of rolls and other goods. We also know that in 1683, the Tapia was listed as a corporal in the St. Augustine African Militia. Juan Marino was a 46-year-old free African blacksmith who came to St. Augustine from Havana as a convict in 1675. He worked as a master charcoal burner in the Royal Forge, burning charcoal and making and repairing weapons. By 1683, he had opened his own forge where he did blacksmithing for the royal armorer and private citizens. Marino was also listed as second lieutenant in the St. Augustine African Militia in 1683. 
War between Spain and England raised the possibility that the Spanish in Florida might mount an attack on Georgia or encourage another rebellion among the black majority in Carolina. The English thus sought to strike first. In 1740, two years after the start of the Mose community and one year after the Stono uprising in Carolina, English forces attacked St. Augustine, led by General James Oglethorpe of Georgia. Oglethorpe led a large but clumsy attack against St. Augustine, using colonial soldiers from Georgia and Carolina, as well as Indian allies. During the attack, Fort Mose was captured. All of the Mose inhabitants reached the safety of the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, where they took refuge along with the rest of St. Augustine's population. Oglethorpe's men occupied Fort Mose during the siege of St. Augustine, but were defeated there in a pitched battle with the black, white, and Indian Spanish forces. Fort Mose was badly damaged in the battle, and the community was abandoned for 12 years. In 1752, the town and fort at Mose were rebuilt in a slightly different location. The former residents, who were by then well settled into town life, moved back to the frontier under pressure from the Spanish authorities who still needed Mose as the colony's first line of defense against the English. The second fort at Mose was a walled enclosure with a moat containing a number of buildings. It was much larger than the first fort, about 65 meters to a side, and was open on one side along the creek. The walls of Mose were made of packed earth, faced with clay and sod, and were planted with cactus. The moat was six feet wide and two feet deep and was probably also planted with cactus. The fort was surrounded by fields farmed by the people of Mose. They lived in palm thatch houses, which initially at least were built inside the protective walls of the fort. An eyewitness account was recorded in 1759 made by the Franciscan priest, Father Juan Joseph de Solana, who was reporting on the conditions in St. Augustine in that year. He wrote, the Fort at Mose is situated on the banks of a river, which runs to the north, and at a distance of three-fourths of a league from the Presidio. The part that faces the river has no protection of defense whatsoever, and is formed by two small bastions, which look landward, on which are mounted two four-pound cannons and six swivel guns divided among them. The earthwork embankment is covered with thorns, and the moat is three feet wide and two feet deep. The housing which it includes are some huts of thatch. The chapel is 10 veras long and 6 wide. The walls which are under construction are made of wood, and the scarcity which is finished and in which the priest lives is a very small room and serves as the chapel of the fort. More than 150 years after its abandonment, Fort Mose was buried from history on a remote island in the Florida marsh. It has required the combined efforts of many different scientists, historians, and legislators to rediscover Mose and bring to light a long lost and little known chapter of our colonial past. The second Fort Mose, built in 1752 and abandoned in 1763, was rediscovered by a combined study of aerial photographs, old maps, and archeological remains. First, modern aerial photographs and 18th century maps were printed at the same scale when they were overlaid, the fort fell on what is today a small island in the marsh. Archaeologists, led by Kathleen Deegan, then began to study the island. They created a contour map of the site, which shows slight rises and depressions in the ground that cannot be seen by the eye alone. Such differences in elevation show where the past human activity took place. The contour map showed clearly where the walls of the fort had been. It also showed that one corner of the fort had been destroyed by a tidal creek. Archaeologists used the contour map in conjunction with the historic maps of the site to guide their excavations. Fort Mose stands as a monument to the courageous African Americans who risked and often lost their lives in the long struggle to achieve freedom. Their legacy is one of tremendous daring and effort, and one which made important contributions to our colonial past. It is critical to our understanding of history that we recognize that the African experience in colonial history was much more than slavery and oppression. The Fort Mose story helps to create a broader vision of our American heritage and communicate that story 
of this early fortress of freedom. <laughs>